Welcome to the re-ride. It's good to see you. I won't pick on you for playing alone. It looks like life is picking on you enough already. Is this your first time on the re-ride? Welcome back. We all had great fun with you last time. And these are your buzzers, as per usual. I am required to inform you that this is a non-profit fan project in no way associated with Jackbox Games. Please wait until the elevator has come to a full stop before you disembark. It's time for the show where high culture and pop culture collide! This episode of The Ray Ride is sponsored by the Ice Hypercube Dispenser. Add a new dimension to your cold drinks. Offer not available in worlds with three spatial dimensions or fewer. And now, here's your host, the Knight Rider of Needless Knowledge, Conan Blankenberg. Hey, 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 welcome to my show. I hear you like your toast soft and right out of the bag, huh? Good for you, really, I mean it. I mean, I won't shake your hand, just to be sure, in case this is contagious, but uh, as long as you keep your distance, I'm sure we can still get somewhat along. Preheat your ovens and fire up your stoves, because today we're going to learn all about the wonders of the kitchen. Time to ride. All right, we'll need some cash to play for. Hit. Here's what this next question is called. Ain't nothing frosty about this frosting. Okay, party time. What temperature would I have to preheat my oven to if I wanted to bake myself a fluffy cake with molten bismuth frosting? 270 degrees Fahrenheit, 270 degrees Celsius, 2700 degrees Rankin, or 27,000 Kelvin. Bismuth's melting temperature is just around 270 degrees Celsius or 518 degrees Fahrenheit, so an oven preheated to that temperature should give us a nice, smooth, and delightfully melty bismuth frosting. Mm. And mm. it does taste a little metally, but I think there's also a subtle touch of citrus and a delightful note of. Oh my god, I think I'm about to have a seizure. <laughs> okay, buzz it. Oh yeah, that's a lot of Benjamins. Nice going. Here's your category. Do not fry this at home. Okay, let's take a look at the question then. How long did the people of the world have to eat their french fries dry and drab until tomato ketchup was finally invented? About as long as the initial run of Futurama, about as long as between Star Wars Episode 6 and 1, about as long as between World Wars 1 and 2, or about as long as it took me to read this question. And the correct answer is... The first recipe for french fries as we know them appeared in 1795, the first recipe for tomato ketchup in 1812, a gap of 17 years, which comes pretty close to the gap between the originals and the prequels of Star Wars at 16 years. Ah, good old ketchup, you wonderful culinary delight. You truly do work on everything, from spaghetti to pizza to... Hey, what if this Italian man just enter my boot? Ow! Smash the button. Nothing to cry over, nothing to phone home about. Here's your category. Catch up with the times! Speaking of ketchup... Say it's before 1812, but you still really, really want ketchup with your french fries. Considering what was commonly known as ketchup before then, what would you have to make do with? Salted mushroom mash, pureed brown trout, slices of banana bread, or no can do, no such thing as ketchup. This answer smells... <laughs> Shall we take a look at the money shot? Ketchup historically came from the United Kingdom and was originally prepared with mushroom and salt. Well, at least I'm not going to be thwacked in the face by an angry Italian man for putting mushrooms and salt on my pizza. Show me the money! Lime of brittle, pea blot, snort, and plowed? That's our category? Oh, of course. No, no. This, this, uh, this isn't our category. It's, uh... Yeah. All right. Well, um, cool. It's gibberish time. All right. The actual category for this gibberish question is... Out of the line, into the trash. Remember, that cash is gonna drop fast, so if you wanna win big, you gotta be quick.
All right, focus your eyes on the screen, forget the punctuation, and then tell me what common kitchen phrase this gibberish rhymes with. Called in step, er, a waste. It's a matter of personal preference. You know, do it your way. And some vital ingredients in cooking. Add seasoning as you see fit. You can definitely see it fit to push that button now, by the way, or all that money is also going to be a waste. What's the matter? You don't do your own cooking? Nana still make all the meals in your house? If you've ever looked at a recipe from anywhere, you always see this line at the very end of it. Before serving, called and step or a waste. Salt and pepper to taste. Or in the case of many a lousy cook, salt and pepper until every sensation of taste has been replaced with a sensation of salt and pepper. Value time, let's go! Thank you, and now introducing... The new sensation frying the nation. Oh, oh, have I told you about my brand new air fryer yet? I'm telling you, best purchase I've ever made. In fact, I don't think I'll ever need any other kitchen apparatus again for the rest of my life. I'm going to revolve my entire identity around this thing now. Say I wanted to join an air fryer owner's club, but instead I accidentally join an air fryer owner's club. Considering the multiple meanings of the word, which of these pieces of small talk would I definitely not hear during the weekly club meetings? I do enjoy how mine is thoroughly devout to the Lord Almighty. The sunset has been so lovely lately by the shores of some of mine. Oh, my dearest one has developed most excellent wing patterns. Or has the orbit of any of yours been oddly unstable too? Oh, the position of the planets predicts a stable financial future for you. Friars are members of a religious order, a group of islands near Tasmania, and a species of butterfly. It's not the name of anything that would orbit around in space. And honestly, I'd still rather own an actual air fryer than any of those other things. Because, mm, those chicken wings, they're to die for. Ah, oh, heavenly crisp. It buzzers a Now that is awesome. Here's your category. Which came first, the barbecue sauce or the marinade? Speaking of chicken wings, why can chickens fly? It's because their wings flap real fast. It's because their wings are lighter than air. It's because their wings have feathers or chickens can't fly. Smart people choose this. It's as simple as that. They just clap them real fast, faster than gravity pulls them to the floor. As good as chicken wings are, I find myself more partial to a well-seasoned chicken finger. Oh, that makes my taste buds fly. Hit your buzzer. Now that is what I call a value. And here is what I call this question. A chilling concoction. So I bought myself this new fridge recently, and I gotta say, this thing is good. Jesus Christ! That scared the shit out of me, always with those toasters, man! I completely forgot I even set one up! Sheesh! So, what just happened to me? My cingulate cortex caused me to freak the hell out. The toaster pawned the crap out of my... The amygdala is one of the key actors in the auditory startle response, which is pretty much what this stupid toaster just made me go through. Well, anyway, glad we cleared that up. Now, let's get back to that question I wanted to ask about my... Oh, who set that thing back off? Come on. Good pick, good pick, and here's your category. A chilling concoction for real this time. Anyway, fridges. Fridge question. Say I bought a new refrigerator that was made by a refrigerator mother. What would supposedly be true about her offspring? It would be likely to develop autism, its extremities would be prone to hypothermia, any milk that comes out of it would be strangely shelf-stable, or its core temperature would drop when near its mother. Yeah, that's the one. The refrigerator mother theory is an early psychological theory that claimed the cause of autism is the lack of maternal emotional warmth during infancy. It's all been proven to be a bunch of bull these days, though. Oh, and before anyone expects me to get startled by the toaster again, not this time. I'm keeping a real good watch on this little fella, and I know exactly when it's gonna- ah! What the- Who the- 
microwave with the ah! Hit your buzzer when it It's a beautiful day for some roadkill. Remember, buzz in when you see the answer that correctly connects the current pair of definitions on the screen. And keep an eye out for that bonus if you're interested in extra cash. Ready to go? Good, then let's begin. Skin condition. And doing it to water turns it to steam. Coffee is a hot one. Lemonade a cold one. Score. Common form of deodorant and common form of pesticide. Blank edge your steak and bone blank. Score. Blank zone at aquatic shows. Blank Mountain at Disneyland. Score! It's painful, Brain Blank, and DC villain, Mr. Blank. Score! Colors hair, and colors food. Okay, now it's time for the bonus question! What do all of the correct answers have in common? Are they all... Things you do with... That's what I like to see! There you go! Good work out there! And now off you go to the showers! And there's your current score. Hope you're proud of it. If not, well, too bad. Let's move on. Okie dokie. Coming up next, the obligatory Hell's Kitchen question. Okay, we're playing for 1241, and here we go. If I were to rate Gordon Ramsay a solid 6 out of 6 on the Ramsay scale, what would that tell you about him? He's devoid of any microorganisms, his surface is perfectly smooth, he's out cold, or he has massive brain damage. Oh dear, oh dear, gorgeous. In medicine, the Ramsey scale is a method of assessing how deeply sedated a patient is, with a 1 meaning they're wide awake and a 6 that they're fast asleep. Incidentally, a 6 on the Ramsey scale is somewhere around where I usually end up when I try to watch an episode of Hell's Kitchen. Picky pick. It's almost over. First, here's your dessert. My oh my, I sure love pie. This Jack Attack only uses locally sourced ingredients. Good luck.
online. Let's check out your total. Ooh, impressive. Too bad no one's here to congratulate you.